So our next writer is a second year fiction writer and she also loves America a lot. Her favorite thing about America is making new friends and her least favorite thing about America is high fructose corn syrup. <laughs> She's also wearing an amazing dress. Everyone please welcome Funke Ogundimu. Okay. Hello everyone. Um, my short story is titled Love on the Marina. My grandmother's room was always dark. Shadows crept along her walls. The only light she allowed was an old table lamp owned by her son, Ajani. Her windows were closed, curtains drawn tight. The smell of camphor balls and lavender mingled with the stale air in her room. Black and white pictures were arranged on the varnished Iroko dressing table. The picture frames turned away from her bed. The first frame was my grandfather, resplendent in Ashoki. I like to imagine that Ashoki is Alari, ruby red Ashoki. Next was grandmother. She has baby Ajani in her arms. Even in the old picture, her eyes sparkle as she looks into his baby face. <coughs> the next picture was my mother on her confirmation day. Her white dress skims her slim knees. On her head is a white beret, but time has darkened the white dress and beret to a cream. Ajani's picture was next. He's in a black suit. His hair parted down the middle. He's sitting, his ankle on his knee, a jointy smile on his lean face. When grandfather died, grandmother stopped coming out of her room. She was always in bed, under covers. The heat in the room was stifling, but she was always cold. The huge canopy bed she slept in swallowed her. Its tall headboard was carved with twirls around, it, around its edge. Good morning, mommy, I say. She turned her face to me. Her unseeing eyes stared at the door where I stood. Her paper-thin skin pulled tight over her skull. Her hair was fluffy and white. I climbed up the bed steps and sat in her bed. How are you, mommy? How are your legs? Should I rub them for you? Should I plait your hair? Do you want water? I made up answers to the questions I asked her. I lifted her torso off the bed and moved behind her, giving her frail back support. I waited for her to sleep in my arms, but she didn't on this day. She gripped my hand, opened and closed her mouth. What? I asked her. Water, food, you want to use the potty? She shook her head vigorously with more energy than I had seen her expend in a long time. She pointed towards her dressing table. I looked over my shoulder. My, fell, my eyes fell on the row of pictures. Grandpa, she groaned. Uncle Ajani's picture, she nodded vigorously. I handed the picture to her. Her frail hands latched onto it she stared at the picture, then placed it against her flat breasts. I watched tears roll down her cheeks, soak her parched skin. I used my hands to wipe away her tears. It's okay, mommy. Don't make me cry. She nodded, took in a deep breath, and smiled. I felt her body relax in my arms. I thought she was asleep, but her body began to rock. Her mouth was open. Her eyes closed. Tears flowed down her face, wetting her nightgown. I leaned forward, put my ear close to her lips. I heard nothing. She died that day. I like to think that she died laughing. Grandmother recounted fully, only once, the events of that day to my mother. Grandfather never spoke of it when he wasn't drunk. Mother said, Grandmother told her Ajani had smiled and waved at her as he was about to walk down the gangplank. 
Ajani was much taller than the man behind him, so she couldn't see the man's face. But she could see her son's face, and he was happy to see her. He didn't throw himself overboard. It happened 50 odd years ago, but whenever I look out to the Lagos Marina and see ships plying the waters between the marina and the Apapa port, I remember the story grandmother told in snippets when she groaned in her sleep, or grandfather sang about when he was drunk, but forgot when he wasn't. Monday 9, January 1956. A fog had come in far off the coast and rolled into Lagos Island, hiding everything on the marina in its cold, deep, white folds. Broad Street, usually visible and audible from the marina, was completely hidden. But you could still hear the muffled horns of cars and the jiggle of bicycle bells. On the muddy sidewalks, people walked with their hands stretched out in front of them, trying not to bump into each other, but they did. They cursed at each other as they picked themselves off the ground, shoving blindly at the whiteness around them. That day, even Christ Church Cathedral stained glass windows and tower were completely hidden in the fog. On the platform of the marina, the dirty, white brown water, the dirty brown waters of the Lagos Lagoon could be heard thumping against the brick walls of the docks. There was a carnival of sorts on the platform. Hawkers walked in and out of the crowd. They balanced trays of sweets, biscuits, oranges, bananas on their heads. Fishermen sold fish pulled out of the water minutes ago. The crowd occasionally paused in their talk and looked expectantly to see, waiting for the arrival of a passenger ship. Children played on the platform, disappearing out of sight. Their mothers couldn't make them stay by their sides. The children's laughter rang all over the platform. The fog couldn't stop them from playing. Aduke and her husband, Ajagbe, were among the people on the platform. At a few minutes past 9 a.m., the fog started to lift, and a ship horn echoed around the marina. It was the Mariana the Sixth. The crowd collectively leaned seaward and watched the ship. Adke stared through the fog, trying to make out the white hulk of the ship as it was moored to the platform, its deck barely visible. Her eyes scanned the passengers that walked on the platform. She couldn't see him. Ajagbe told her to stop fretting. She watched groups of Alaru carry boxes of portmanteau and carpet bags off the ship. Around her, she heard people cry out with joy when they spotted the person they were waiting for. They shoved her aside as they rushed past her, pushing through the crowd to the front. Aduke pulled her iboru around her shoulders. She was getting worried. She knew the crowd disembarking from the ship was thinning out because there was less shouts of joy around her. The fog taunted Aduke. It would fade for the deck to be visible and then deepen again. She would peer at the opening, but didn't see him. Then Ajagwe touched her elbow. He pointed at the ship. Her eyes followed his finger to the spot he pointed at, and through a slight opening of the fog, she saw him, her son Ajani. He carried a portmanteau instead of the metal case she had bought for him at the Tumota. He wore a black suit and looked taller, but had lost weight. His letters home were often filled with his dislike of English food. She smiled. He had grown a beard too. It was her turn to rush forward now. She screamed, her arms stretched out. She cried out his name. He couldn't hear her. He stood on the fridge of the crowd, but it pulled him towards the gangplank. Aduke moved towards him, shoving people out of her way. Ajagwe followed after his wife, moving into the tiny spaces vacated by her. The crowd had pulled Ajani onto the gangplank. Ajani, I am here, his mother screamed, undoing her head tie in, a, in, a, in excitement. She tied it around her waist. She jumped and screamed, waving at him with both hands. He waved back at her, a huge smile on his face. What happened next was, 
and is still a mystery shrouded in that foggy morning. The captain of the Mariana VI said Ajani fell off the gangplank into the Lagos Lagoon. He saw Ajani's plunge through a window at the bridge. He happened to look out of it just then. He said he saw Ajani trip over his portmanteau and fall overboard. A passenger who said he was way behind Ajani saw a man push him. Another passenger woman said she saw a man bump into Ajani. The man was in a hurry to get off the ship, but he didn't push Ajani. <laughs> a ship steward said Ajani was a quiet passenger during the voyage. He had read a leather-bound book on the deck and ate his meals alone in a corner of the dining room. He said he saw Ajani bend to pick something up on the deck and the crowd knocked him overboard into the lagoon. A woman who was on the platform on that day said nobody pushed Ajani. She said she saw him drop his portmanteau and jump overboard. She saw him because she had her eyes on the woman next to Ajani, her sister. The harbour master on duty said he didn't hear or see anything. The fog was too thick. Over 20 fishermen dove into the lagoon that foggy morning, searching for Ajani. They knew Adike. She had grown up with some of them on the island. They told her they would find him. Adike watched the waters. Her face was streaked with tears. Her damask head tie mangled in her hands. Her iboru, iro, bag and shoes forgotten, flung away from her. She sat in her underskirt and booba on the cold platform, watching and praying, but they didn't bring up her son. Her husband stood still beside her, his hands behind him, gnashing his teeth. The Christchurch Cathedral's tower clock faithfully kept the time. It pealed the hours loudly for the marina to hear. Aduke wheeled the clock to stop counting, but it didn't. The cold morning turned into a sweltering afternoon, and a fog rolled back to where it came from. His body was not found that day, the next day, or the day after. But Aduke was at the marina for 41 days at 9 a.m. sharp. Nobody could persuade her otherwise. She walked up and down the length of the platform, crying and wailing, dressed in black. She would go down to the coastline, sit on the bench, on the beach, her hands in the frothing waters. She tried to pull her son out. People came to know her as Yaja Nionigbe. As the years went by, the story of Ajani grew many versions. When families see their children off to school abroad, someone will remember and tell a different version of the story of Iyajani the whaler. And at the end of the story, they will pray against such mishaps, mothers especially. They prayed fervently against the great sadness that engulfed Iyajani Onigbe. The old ones that live in crumbling story buildings, tucked in the damp alleys of Lagos Island, also know the story but I'll tell a different one. They say Ajani was already dead when his mother saw him. They say he only came to say goodbye to his mother. They say he was an Akudaya. It is night. I am walking along the marina, the outer marina. I stop at the edge of the platform and look out to the Lagos Lagoon. I have pictures of Uncle Ajani, my grandmother and grandfather in a nylon bag. The wind ruffles my twisted braids and plasters my linen trousers to my legs. Canoes bob on the lagoon, light from the insides of ships are reflected on the black, restless waters. I stare at the lagoon. I can hear grandmother's voice tell of that day in disjointed fragments, her anguish at helplessness over the sound of the waves. Ajani's story didn't end after grandmother's 41 days of mourning. It grew another layer. After the fear of the accident had died down, father went to the shipping line to collect Ajani's baggage. It was never found. The captain of the ship checked his record, records and couldn't find Ajani's name on the passenger list. The steward who had seen him changed his story. He said he had never seen him during the Liverpool-Lagos voyage. Grandfather wrote to, wrote to Ajani's university in, in, in England. 
the university said Ajani moved out of his hall on 12 October 1955. What happened during those three months? Who did my grandparents see on that day? Further investigations were stalled as the Mariana VI never docked again at the Lagos Marina. It was decommissioned the next year. On that foggy Monday morning, my maternal family cracked. They tried to hide that crack deep in their lives. They covered it with expensive clothes and smiles and lived with heartache and despair for the rest of their lives. But they couldn't cover it completely. You only had to take a glance at their lives to see it. Grandfather died with his favorite companion by his side, an empty green bottle of schnapps under his arm. Oftentimes, he was led home drunk, covered with the filth of gutters he fell into on his way home, singing about his son, Ajani. Grandmother lost her mind and lived the rest of her life in her room. I got a miserable, miserable mother. She raised a sad child. A ship horn echoes around the marina, and I look at the slowly moving ship. I take in a deep breath and fling the black and white pictures into the Lagos Lagoon, those happy pictures into its gloomy depths. Thank you. Woo!